We've been in the study of Acts for uh, a long time and uh, <laughs> years, really. <laughs> Chris and I were saying it feels like years, but uh, well, we're halfway there. <laughs> anyway, we're in uh, Acts 17, and uh, this is a great passage. Um, uh, it, we're going to start um, about the middle of it. And I'm reading from the message today just because uh, Eugene Peterson has a great translation. And it's a little bit longer passage. So, the longer Paul waited in Athens for Silas and Timothy, the angrier he got. <laughs> All those idols. The city was a junkyard of idols. He discussed it with the Jews and other like minded people at their meeting place, and every day he went out in the streets and talked with anyone who happened along. He got to know some of the Epicurean and Stoic intellectuals pretty well through these conversations. Some of them dismissed him with sarcasm. What an airhead. Others, <laughs> listening to him go on about Jesus and the resurrection, were intrigued. That's a new slant on the gods. Tell us more. These people got together and asked him to make a public presentation over at the Areopagus, where things were a little quieter. They said, this is a new one on us. We've never heard anything quite like it. Where did you come up with this, anyway? Explain it so we can understand. Downtown Athens was a great place for gossip. There were always people hanging around, natives and tourists alike, waiting for the latest tidbit on most anything. So Paul took his stand in the open space at the Areopagus and laid it out for them. It's plain to see that you Athenians take your religion seriously. When I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with all the shrines I came across, and then I found one inscribed, To the God Nobody Knows. I'm here to introduce you to this God, so you can worship intelligently and know who you're dealing with. The God who made the world and everything in it, this master of sky and land, doesn't live in custom-made shrines or need the human race to run errands for him as if he couldn't take care of himself. He makes the creatures. The creatures don't make him. Starting from scratch, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. We live and move in him, can't get away from him. One of your own poets said it well. We're the God created. Well, if we are the God created, it doesn't make a lot of sense to think we could hire a sculptor to chisel a God out of some stone for us, does it? God overlooks it as long as you don't know any better, but that time has passed. The unknown is now known, and he's calling for a radical life change. He set a day when the entire human race will be judged and everything set right, and he's already appointed the judge, confirming him before everyone by raising him from the dead. At the phrase, raising him from the dead, the listeners split. Some laughed at him and walked off making jokes. Others said, oh, let's do this again. We want to hear more. But that was it for the day, Paul left. There were still others, it turned out, who were convinced then and there and stuck with Paul. Among them, Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris. So pray with me. Lord, we uh, are probably more like the Athenians than we'd like to believe. And so... Teach us from your word how we can let go of our idols and let go of our self-made beliefs and begin to trust you. Thank you that you are present and not playing hide and seek. Thank you that you love us and pursue us through it all. Give us the courage to trust you. That's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, this uh, passage has been uh, used a lot. I used to teach preaching at uh, Fuller Seminary in their doctoral program, and people would always use this passage as an example of how great that Paul was as a preacher. You know, he'd walk around and he'd hear everybody, and then he'd find ways. He'd even quote the uh, Greek philosopher, you know, at the end there, poet. And, uh, but I always looked at it weird and went, well, wait a minute, there was no real response. 
if he was so great, how come everybody walked away or just said, well, I'll try this again, you know? Uh, he had two conversions that day. <laughs> And uh, so it wasn't all that. He wasn't like Billy Graham or anything. But, um, but then I think, wait a minute. We can learn a lot about uh, how we share from this passage. Because uh, it starts out pretty realistic. Paul is in Athens. And uh, he's waiting for some friends to show up. And they're late. And he does what he evidently normally did, which is... I'll walk around and talk to people and listen, pay attention. Uh, he, he went to the synagogue and, and uh, talked there, and listened there. And then in his work at the marketplace uh, where he made tents, uh, he would talk to people as they walked by and listened and cared and began to observe. And I think, you know, that's the first part of, of being a witness, isn't it? Is that we start to pay attention and we start to notice the people around us, and we start to listen and engage with them and hear what the cares of their life is. And uh, uh, my old boss, uh, and you press, uh, Bruce Larson, used to describe it as we, uh, somebody's like an island, and we, we row around in a little rowboat until we find a place to dock. <laughs> you know, if you find a interest or a, a problem or an issue, and then you pull your boat up there. And that's when you start the relationship. I always thought that was a, a nice image, although I don't do robots. But, um, the thing is that uh, he did this, and the more he heard, and the more he discussed, and the more he observed, what's the Bible say? The angrier he got. He got frustrated. He was angry. He didn't like what he was hearing and seeing. And then it begins to shift, and we hear about these two philosophical groups the uh, Epicureans and the Stoics, right? Anybody have beginning philosophy? And <laughs> okay. So, uh, basically, the, the Epicureans, this is your brief lecture on philosophy here, and the Stoics, uh, they had one thing in common. They both agreed life is short and meaningless. Fantastic. Fantastic. So they had that common ground. Then they went two different directions on what do we do about it, basically. The Epicureans um, thought, well, life is short and meaningless, so let's have a lot of passion, let's live well, life is short, live large, um, indulge the senses, food and drink and whatever it is that makes you passionate, and uh, live it out. The Stoics believe life is short and meaningless, so they went the other direction, which is uh, if you're in a lot of pain and problems and struggle, don't let it show. And keep control, self-discipline, high morals, for no purpose other than you just decided to do this. So you have the Epicureans on one side, live in large, and you have the Stoics on the other side saying, hold back. And both of them felt like they could control their lives this way. And in the midst of it, evidently, there's all these little uh, idols and shrines and temples and symbols to help people make their life more substantial, basically. Right? I mean, that's, what, that's what the idol's for. It's to give substance to your life. Uh, if you have hopes and you don't know if they'll come true, you have this solid thing to hold on to. Um, uh, if you have difficulties and pain, you, you have a solid way, a uh, foundation for your faith because you're, you're, you can look to this idol that's been made and it will give you that sense of... Uh, you're not just drifting around. So the idols, you know, they fulfill a, an important a purpose. Uh, but they became really irritating to, to Paul. Well, he's looking around and, and he's just going, this is just uh, unacceptable. So he's invited to the Areopagus, which is, uh, if you've been to Athens, uh, the Parthenon, you know, the big thing that they always show in the 
travel log, <laughs> pillory thing up on the hill. Okay, uh, right at, at the base, across from the Parthenon, is this big boulder, basically. And uh, people gather, they still gather there today. I mean, I, I was there with a group of uh, travelers, and we, we did a, uh, we met on the Areopagus on the rock, and watched the sun come up over the Parthenon. Cool, cool. And then we read this passage, and we talked about what it meant. And we're in the very spot where Paul is there talking with you. You could do it today. And all around you in Athens is almost the same as uh, it was back then. There's tourists and people and students and uh, scholars, and everybody's moving around and merchants, and all this stuff is going on around you, just like them. And I thought, just like Seattle. It's exactly like Seattle. You've got the intellectuals and the students. I heard that, what's that school? Uh, you <laughs> Yeah. When I, I'm just, this is off the subject, but when, when I first came here, like in 1981 or so, and uh, working in the U District, and some of the people kept talking about the UW, and I didn't know what it was. <laughs> What is this you dub? <laughs> and they looked at me like, yeah. <laughs> I have now learned <laughs> it's that place of idol worship over. <laughs> but but I mean Seattle's a cool place because you have tourists and you and you have uh, well now we have a, a big not a merry-go-round but a sideways merry-go-round. What do they call it? Ferris wheel. Ferris wheel. <laughs> Yeah, sideways merry go -round. There you go, right there. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we've got that. We've got, you know, the Space Needle. Yeah, you know, we've got things so tourists can come here, but then we also have the locals who, who we all know that we're so much better than them. And, uh, you know, you can always tell the tourists because they have raincoats and boots and umbrellas, you know. The locals don't because we know it's not raining yet, but it will down the road. And so, anyway, you can tell the difference. And and this is an epicenter. The Northwest here is an epicenter for uh, creative, new, religious, uh, funky thinking. You know, that's we're we're leading the nation in funky thinking, <laughs> uh, full religion. You know, and very much like Athens. And uh, uh, philosophies abound here, uh, and then they disappeared, and new ones come up. But um, so we're very similar to that. And how do we live and what, uh, how do we relate to the people around us at work or in our neighborhoods or even, honestly, even in our families? How do we relate? How do we witness? How do we share the, the reality of a living God who is present, not just an ethereal gas off somewhere, you know, but but present and involved in caring, and and a uh, tangible uh, savior who's risen from the dead. We're speaking. Of, did you did you see in the paper yesterday that they've uh, they've been doing some research at the at the uh, site in Jerusalem where the uh, tomb is, and and they've gone through these layers of marble now, and they've. Uh, uh, found that they think they can get down through there and find the original limestone walls of the cave that Jesus was buried in, and they're and they're now doing their work to go down in there. And they're saying this is a huge discovery. Well, I just want to tell them there's nothing there. Okay, <laughs> you know, just saying, you know, <laughs> this is gonna, yeah, this is gonna be really disappointing. <laughs> but anyway, that that work's going on and. Uh, and that, that tomb is, is they're going to find out it's empty. Um, or I blew my gig, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, it's not, but, uh, but both the Stoics and the Epicureans, see that segue, both wanted life their way. Whether they did it by pursuing passion and indulgence and richness, or whether they did it by uh, morality and self-discipline and, and rigorousness, Either one, they wanted it their way. They felt like they could control it. 
And I can't help but think that uh, our world is filled with closet Epicurean and Stoic folk. Sometimes our churches are filled with it too. And, and for no other reason than they're just wanting to control their world. And, and honestly, I like having choices, don't you? You like making up your own mind and um, the idea of submitting to God who loves us and pursues us and has a, a, a plan for our lives it can get a little nervous, you know? Um, years ago, there was a Volvo ad. Um, and I, I, I loved it because it really showed this kind of tension. Like, this is what the Volvo ad said. There is an inherent conflict built into our lives. We long for... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, 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 oh. I'm glad that's my words. <laughs> it didn't sound like a Volvo ad, did it? No, those were my words. We'll get to them later. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you don't preach for a week. It's, a, it's just like, it's all gone. Anyway, okay, so here's the Volvo ad. Let me see if this one makes a little more sense to y'all. <clears throat> Let's see. You have choices. I do, I don't. That's very Epicurean and Stoic, isn't it? Yeah, anyway. That wasn't in the ad. One kid, two kids. Public school, private school. Start your own business, plan your career. Stock market, CDs, buy a performance car, buy a safe car. Desire, need, passion, responsibility. Yes. That was a childish amen. Or is it, see, so, see, desire, need, passion, responsibility. Or is it responsibility, passion, need, desire? Got to give them the right order. The dichotomy of life stares us right in the face every day. Choices that define how we live our lives and what's important. Where we choose to live. What schools to send our kids to. A family vacation? Any vacation at all. Protect the ones you love? Take skydiving lessons. <laughs> Can one be responsible and not be boring? <laughs> Dreams. Reality. Questions we all ask ourselves every day. Then here it comes. Can a car company possibly have all the answers? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> At least it's truth in advertising. No, we cannot have all the answers. But at Volvo, we may have one. <laughs> what is that? You are in charge. Pick your life. How do you want it to be? Do you want it to be safe and responsible? Or do you want it to be exciting and adventurous? Do you want it to be leisure filled or disciplined? Pick your life. What a cool ad for the Epicureans and the Stoics within us, right? Which is it gonna be? Family responsibility and safety or skydiving? And some of you made your choice. <laughs> just, just saying. Well, we have a tension. And, it, and it, just like the tension that the Athenians were experiencing there in the Areopagus. And I think that Paul is so wise to come in and say, wait a minute. It's not yours to choose. It's not this or that and you're in charge. The whole point is, there's a God who made you and made me who's in charge. And we can deny it and we can act as if it weren't true and we could act uh, as if we really are the creators of our own world. But that's not reality. And the reality is, that this God who made us and knows us and loves us and calls us by name has invited us into a relationship 
that is revolutionary and life-changing and uh, trans transformational. Now, I told Will that the title of this message is Conflict of Interest. And the reason is that I think that we have inside of us an inherent conflict of interest. I have it. I think you have it too. You can argue with me about it. On the Areopagus. <laughs> I'm not here. Okay, now we're going to get to my words. We long for personal intimacy. And we cling to autonomy and self-interest. We want intimacy, but we also want our own thing. We want to experience meaningful community. <clears throat> But then we resist whatever it is that might restrict our personal freedom. Don't want to give that up. We really love independence. And we really feel a need for companionship. That's in conflict. We have high expectations, I do this mostly about myself, but you, you can listen in. High expectations of what we deserve, what we have coming, right? I deserve better. But then we match it up with feeling low self-esteem and inferiority. How does that work? I know, I know. We want to live meaningful lives. And then we devote all our time and energy to TV, eating out, spectator sports, and shopping. Boom. <laughs> How? We've got a conflict of interest. We honestly, and I believe this about every one of you, we honestly want to make a contribution to other people's lives. We want that. You want that. And at the same time, we passionately guard our personal space and our comfort zones. How have we become the people of Athens? We want this, but we want this. And, we're, and our, our, we, we have a conflict inside. We have a war inside. We want to make a difference in the world. But you know, the hawks are on this morning. You know? <laughs> We want to be in community, and we want to know and be known, and we want to love and be loved, and we want intimacy, and we want our personal space, and we want to be left alone, and we don't want to share. They're both true. It's time that we take seriously the unknown God that Paul found the shrine for. The God we don't know yet. Because it does matter. The, the philosophers at either side thought life is short, it doesn't matter. And we make our choices. God tells us life is short and it matters immensely. It matters immensely. And instead of just clinging to our choices based on our our conflicts of interest, we can actually try something radical, which is, and this is a strong word, I'm sorry, you know, I hate to use strong words in front of you, um, submission. Where we say, like Jesus had to pray in the garden before his death, not my will, but thy will be done. Have your way in me, Lord. Today, I'm not going to choose based on, do I want this or do I want that? Do I need this or do I need that? We're not going to do that. We're going to base today on, Lord, what would you have for me? What would you have for me to do? What would you have for me to say? Who would you have me talk to today? Who would you have me notice in the crowd and pay attention to? What part of a conversation, Lord, would you say, that's the dock where you could pull your boat in? and make a connection that could change a life. Another quote for you. I quotes today. This, this one, all, okay, this, sorry man, this flashed through the past. This is my old boss, Bruce Larson. He had a book, uh, I think, 
It might have been the last book he wrote at U Press, but it's called The Presence. And uh, in it, he says this, the great good news for God's people today is that he is in on this. He's not in a cloud or a pillar of fire. He's not in a tabernacle or a temple. The Holy Spirit of our delivering God is in the hearts of his faithful people. We may turn to other idols temporarily, but his love and forgiveness are certain. We may feel abandoned, cut off by illness, loss, misfortune, but help is always on the way because we're promised not just deliverance, but the love and presence of the deliverer. It matters. Now, if you take the challenge today and say, Lord, come into my life, be Lord of my life, forgive me, lead me forward, fill me with your spirit, I can, I'm going to make a guarantee to you. If you do that today, I guarantee that in the years to come, your life will be filled with trouble. <laughs> you will have problems, you will have disappointments, you will have heart. If you live long enough, every single person you love will die. I, I guarantee that. If you let Christ be Lord of your life today. Well then, what do we have? What are we left with? You know what we're left with? The love and care of the deliverer who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You're not alone. And life may be short, but it's not meaningless. It does matter. Your life matters. Your life matters to the Lord. Isn't that strange? We sang, take my life and let it be, you know, take my life. I think that's the prayer for us today. Lord, take my life. With all the conflicts, with all the struggle, with all the joys, with all the sorrows, with all the heartbreaks, with all the hopes, all of it. And, and, and you don't have to be stoic and you don't have to be Epicurean, okay? Just look to the one who loves you, who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You belong to him. That's his word for today. The Lord, come into our lives today. Come into our minds and our hearts and our relationships and our, and our issues. And fill us with your spirit. Transform us by your power. And give us the courage to look to you and not try to make our lives substantial with other stuff. We need you. We need you. And we love you. Give us the courage to, to follow you.